Welcome to the Senate Environment and Natural Resources Policy and Legacy Finance Committee. Today is Monday, February 21st, 2022, approximately 1 p.m. Today we have before us uh, Senate File 26, or excuse me, 2969. Uh, this bill will be going to finance when you're through. So, Senator Lang, welcome to the committee um, when you're ready. Well, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Senator Andrew Ling here with uh, what is the annual uh, Lassard Sam's Outdoor Heritage Council uh, Outdoor Heritage Fund uh, appropriation bill. Uh, Senate file 2969 is, uh, well, it's a con uh, <laughs> the culmination of actually a, years of a year of work um, that the 12 members of the board and a couple of wisecracking senators and, and house members come together and uh, spend spend their time uh, during the summer months trying to figure out where we're going to spend uh, all this uh, fortunate money. Uh, again, the Outdoor Heritage Fund and the bill uh, specifically, uh, I asked Mark to come up with some numbers for me just to give some comparisons and, and talk about exactly what we've done over the last, since well, since 2008 when there was the first initial uh, year of the Outdoor Heritage Fund. But uh, as of right now, and this is what he said, only 1.18 seven million uh, acres protected, restored, or enhanced, which is a pretty substantial uh, amount of property if you think about it. Uh, but this year uh, in the bill, there is over 80,000 acres, and if you could see on your handout, over 80,000 acres of wildlife habitat throughout Minnesota that is estimated to be restored, enhanced, or protected, 127 miles of shoreline, and an additional uh, $33 million, over $33 million of federal, state, and private uh, funding is going to be uh, leveraged as a result of what we're going to do in the bill. Uh, there's a, also a, a large variety of uh, non-governmental agencies that, that benefit from this, including you know the ones like Pheasants Forever, Ducks Unlimited, uh, the Nature Conservancy are some that keep popping up uh, as, as fiscal agents and recipients of outdoor heritage funds. Uh, but the, the ones I like talking about are some of the smaller uh, groups to include, uh, if you look on the back sheet of your handout, the Fox Lake Conservation League, which is a very small group that uh, benefits from uh, the Outdoor Heritage Funds and, and the Lassard Sam's Bill. Uh, the Morrison County uh, Soil and Water Conservation District, uh, the City of Rogers, uh, and then also a little bit bigger ones, but uh, the, the Dakota County, Washington County, uh, the Two Rivers Watershed District, for examples. So it's, it's an all-encompassing bill. Uh, it is 26 pages of some of the most rewarding, I believe, spending projects that we're probably going to have in the, in the legislature. So uh, it is a bipartisan uh, effort. Uh, everything that we do every year is, involves both Democrats, Republicans, and, and members of the, uh, the Outdoor Heritage Committee, uh, the Lassard Sam's Committee, that... Uh, they come from all aspects of, of life. So as we go forward, it's a, it's a, a lot of work. Um, it's, a, it's a big three-ring binder that we carry around. We talk about that every year. And when it comes via FedEx, the, you know, the little lady that comes to my house has a big, huge box. So, But uh, with that, Madam Chair, I think I'm going to turn it over to the, to the real experts in the room, uh, Mr. Mark Johnson and uh, Joe Pavelko. Both uh, do a lot of work on an annual basis as well and uh, probably know in depth the bill better than what I do. So. And Senator Lang, I just want to say, I, I think I tell this story often because I see you working with that binder. And it is a lot of, a, a lot of work and to go through all the projects. And, and I know that um, all the folks that serve um, on the council really, really work very, very hard. A lot of hours go into really vetting those projects. And so um, I just want to thank you and all those members for doing that because I have seen you haul that, that <laughs> big book around to work on, so thank you for that. Uh, with that, um, welcome uh, Mr. Johnson to the committee. Um, it's good to have you here, good to see you. It's, it's lovely to see people's faces, right, at the table, so welcome. Uh, please state your name for the record and proceed when you're ready. Madam Chair, my name is Mark Johnson. I'm the Executive Director for the Lassard Sam's Outdoor Heritage Council. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Nice to be here with you today, Senator. 
The, um, uh, the bill as it stands before you is about a 100, just over $155 million uh, appropriations bill with and all of those are recommendations for spending from the Outdoor Heritage Fund through the Lassard Sam's Outdoor Heritage Council's recommendation process. Um, as the Senator said, the, um, as Senator Lang said, this is a, uh, it's a long process. It starts actually in April 1st of each year when the call for funding requests goes out. So we're just about ready for the next round to, to be looking at here in another month and a half. Um, and then that in May, that's closed. And through the summer, the council is, is vetting these projects, um, criteria, ranking them on a criteria basis. There are 10 sound criteria that they work with. And then after they've ranked them, then they go back and they actually have hearings from each one of those presenters. So that they are then providing the information, telling the council what is good and what is, what's even better with their programs and how they're going to do things. Um, from this process, you heard Senator Lang mention many of the highlights of this bill. Um, what I'd like to do is bring is take you through this bill overview that was handed, it was sent out and handed out to you as well. And then I'll just refer to it here and, uh, by showing it once in a while so the public can see exactly what we're looking at. The first page, of course, is some of the highlights of the bill. In the middle of the bill is where it kind of gets down to the guts, where what the detail is, the data. On your left side of the brochure, and on the right side are two different columns, two different perspectives of what's happening. On your left side is the outputs by acres, and everything down that side is referring to the acreage. On the right side of the page, it's regarding to the funding. So the acreage is, is what's happening and where, and on the right side, the funding side, it's more what's happening and how much. So um, as you look, first of all, the first pie chart on the top, on the left, that's how it distributes from an acreage-wise as far as what work will happen in the state um, from these funds. And again, acreage-wise. So 62% of the, of the acres that will be worked on are strictly enhancement. And so much for res restoration, protection, and fee with PILT, without PILT, and protection through easement. On the, left side, on the right side of the page, it's the same thing, except it's how the dollars break out within each of those activities of, of protection, um, um, restoration, et cetera. And then you get into the middle of the page. The bar charts are the distribution of acres on the left side by ecological section. And on the right side, it's the funding by ecological section. So for that ecological section, you want to refer to that top middle um, uh, picture of the state. And you can see there's a prairie ecological section. There's a prairie forest transition. There's a metro urban, or, um, metropolitan urbanizing area, southeast Minnesota and the northern forest. Those are the ecological um, uh, acre or ecological sections that are being referred to in each of these bar charts. And it gives you a chance to look at not just how the acres break out in each of those areas, but how the funding breaks out. For instance, um, on the right side in the funding, the distribution of funds for the metro urban area is about $26 million of this, of the, of the recommendations in this bill. And 24,000 for the prairie forest transition and so on. In the very bottom, the charts, on the very bottom of the page, you're going to see that really refers to more by activity and um, in, what, um, in what types of habitat, I should say. It depends on habitat. So for instance, on the left bottom, you have the acres types. The activity would be restore, protect by fee, uh, enhance, whatever it might be. And then you can actually look at how does that break down for wetlands. And you can see that there's about 17,000 acres of wetlands that are planned to be enhanced, restored, or protected through this. And about 24,000 acres of prairies, 33,000 acres of forests, and so on. And those are through the easements, they're through um, the acquisition and fee, but, and they're through other projects where it's already public land, but it's going to be enhanced or restored. And on the right is looking at the funding of that. There's a little bit of a loss here that happens too, because when you're looking at the acres for protect in fee or an easement, those acres are also, after they're acquired, they're also restored or enhanced up to a level of, of what we want for what the state wants for acceptability for the habitat on those properties. Those dollars aren't, the, those acres that are enhanced or restored that are protected also, bought or eased, are not in the restore and enhance portions of these charts. That's just kind of extra 
And the reason we don't put them in is we don't want to make it look like we're double counting acres. So looking at true acreages that are going to be um, uh, affected one way or another. On the back of this pamphlet, you'll see that there's a whole list of projects and recommended appropriations. This is in the same format as in your bill, same chronology or chronological order. So you can see up in the top left, you see subdivision two is the prairies. That's subdivision two in the bill. And subdivision three is forests and so on. And this is just to give you a little quicker way to, to look at them all. Um, most of the projects in this bill, in fact, uh, roughly 40 or 39 of them, something like that, are um, repeat phases for recommended funding. And those are ones that have come back to the council and, and proven that they're doing good work. The council says, all right, we like the work you're doing. We like the, your, uh, how you're doing it, um, your fiscal constraints. We like how you're spending the money in the proper fashion, et cetera. We're willing to give you another, another year of funding on this or another phase. Uh, there are some that come back and don't get their next phase. There are others that don't come back the second year that may wait till the third year to come for a repeat phase. So it's every other year or more. But each one is looked at individually. Some of the new projects in here, um, underneath Forest, there's the big woods protection at Steeg Woods. That's the city of Rogers. That's a, a, one of the new ones. Um, another new one is actually through Bowser, which was interesting. It's the integrated habitat and clean water. And Bowser has taken an a, a, a interesting new way through the one watershed, one plan in the soil and water conservation districts to have, tier, have stacked benefits for clean water and habitat and, and really uh, being able to exactly determine how they're going to get that. Washington County, um, the Habitat Protection and Restoration Partnership is another new proposal that came in this year and that council really liked. The DNR came up with a newer one, a new one that did not get funding last year. They came back, they, they reviewed it, they redid it, came back and the council said that we like this one and that's the fish passage enhancement is down near the bottom. It's targeted culvert replacement and that's all gonna happen up in Lake County in combination with the county and the townships. So very interesting project. Uh, there's the enhancing Metro and North Shore trout stream habitats. And that's gonna, that's got some really unique stuff to it as well I can talk about, but I don't wanna use up our whole time. And the last one is really close, it's less than a mile from here, and that's that daylighting of Phelan Creek, which will happen right over by Sweet Hollow. So, um, and in that area, just across the, across the highway. Um, with that, Madam Chair, I could, we could go on a long time for sure, and we can go into this bill as much detail as you'd like, but we'll stand for questions. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Um, I really appreciate uh, your presentation and how you put it together um, because it's very uh, easy to read and easy to follow, and, and uh, your breakouts are, are, um, are really excellent, so I'm gonna thank you for that. It's, it really helps us when we're not involved in the process to see all these projects and then see, see the percentages and, it looks like you've done a really good job in making sure everything is um, uh, well funded. I, I just think that this is a, this is a great presentation. So thank you for that. Uh, members, are there questions? Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> I just want to get some clarification. Uh, there's 5,521 acres protected in fee with PILT, the 2858 in fee without PILT. Could, uh, we all know what PILT is, but can you tell me what, which acres the without PILT acres are, who owns them, what acres are worked with in that scenario? Mr. Johnson or Senator Lang? I, I, Madam Chair and Senator Weber, I think that's probably going to be a more complicated answer uh, than what we could provide for you today. Other, yeah, other than saying a specific project, we could probably list them all. Yeah. Well, and, and, and I'm not so concerned about specific projects, Madam Chair, uh, as, as, okay, so what types of land are without PILT payments that you're working with? Mr. Johnson, and, and for those, uh, we have a lot of people listening in, so maybe you can just, just explain what PILT stands for. Uh, Madam Chair and Senator Weber, thank you for that question. The uh, uh, PILT is payment in lieu of taxes. And when the state 
uh, acquires a parcel, the state then pays payment in lieu of tax. If that property comes off the tax roll, pays that payment in lieu of tax to the county. Um, so there's not a loss uh, at the loss of that, at, at the land coming off the tax roll, there's not a loss to the county. That's the, the, the reason behind PILT. Um, PILT that is with, or, or land that is purchased in fee with PILT is generally goes to the state of Minnesota and then the state of Minnesota makes that PILT payment. The legislature, of course, you all uh, provide that financial uh, portion for the state to be able to do. The, the non-PILT is where the land stays on the tax roll or it is in, in, in those instances it would be held by a nonprofit and the nonprofit then would pay those taxes in perpetuity or as each year. The, uh, it could go to the federal government in which they have something similar to PILT but it's a little different system where they make accommodation for that, the tax, um, uh, something like tax. The, um, otherwise it would go to a local unit of government or to a county. Uh, some, uh, in counties it would generally go to state forest land. Uh, sometimes it could go to a park in a county or a city or so on. So those are the non-pilt. Another portion of non-pilt, which is fairly large, especially in the easements, is through Bowser. And that's where the easements are for, of course, crap or things like that. Very good. Thank you. Are there other questions, members? Senator Herr. Um, I, I saw a project in my district, Phelan Creek, and daylighting and uh, Senator Shrozen uh, is about, you know, so I, I can't explain it thoroughly. Um, I'm pretty sure it's connected to indigenous, you know, initiative. So if you can explain that a little bit to, to all of us, so, you know, that could be Mr. Johnson. Today. Madam Chair and Senator Herr, thank you for that question too. The um, uh, daylighting of Phelan Creek is a project, it's uh, near the end of the bill and it's in uh, subdivision five, but it's actually, Phelan Creek back in the 30s was most of Phelan Creek, almost all of it from Lake Phelan, from just shy of Lake Phelan down to the Mississippi was put underground, put into the storm sewers and, and so it was, that way they could, you know, you didn't have to worry about the water above ground. This is actually taking a portion of that first, starting at Phelan Creek and down about through Sweet Hollow there and actually bringing it back above ground allowing that creek to go its traditional channel, to go and traditional, it, basically, they're gonna to have to engineer it to make sure it's, it's taken care of properly. And, and then it'll have to go back, it'll be rerouted again to finish out going underground because otherwise we'd be going through the intersections and the interstate and everything else. Um, but it's an interesting project, again, allowing that, um, uh, an area that was is very important to our um, Native Americans and indigenous populations. Um, in fact, this project is being led by the Lower Fre Phelan Creek Project, which um, uh, Maggie Lorenz is the executive director of that. She also is the director for the Wakan Tipi Center, and um, very broad section uh, of the community is involved in this. Uh, it's not just Lower Phelan Creek project itself, but they have incorporated in this really unique community to, to ask for this funding. Uh, it's going to be an interesting project. It's a big challenge, but it'll create some wonderful opportunities in the future and again, bringing this creek back to the surface. Senator Herr. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you for the clarification. I, my colleague here just asked me quickly, so I thought you'd be a better person to explain it. And I do realize that in the days, um, Battle Creek was uh, was a trail where was, was the channel where the uh, Native American will canoe down from the Mississippi to harvest wild rice at Lake Phelan. But that's that's eons ago, and I, I look forward to to this project from happening. Thank you. Thank you, um, and Senator Hur, I just love the name Swede Hollow. It sounds like <laughs> something that would be in northern Minnesota too. So, <laughs> oh, there, there's a lot of history. Uh, you know, on that, and I, I, I use it as an example for my new American population all the time because at one point the suite was new Americans, you know, and that's why the beginning of Sweet Hollow, and I'm, I'm glad that there was activists that tried to protect that area, you know, avoid from uh, the light, well, light rail uh, track coming through and they were able to preserve that, but there's a lot of history there, you know, the Sweet Institute to keep up libraries and archives about the, the history of Sweet Hollow. 
So we're, we're trying to preserve as much as we can. Thank you. Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was just going to ask Mr. Johnson how the Norwegians let the Swedes get ahead of them in naming that hollow. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Johnson. <laughs> um, Madam Chair, Mr. Weber, I'm sure my father, who was Norwegian, and my mother, who was mostly Swede, had that same argument. So. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Any other discussion? Senator Lang, uh, would you like to make the motion to move the bill to finance? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, I would, I would very much like to do that. Thank you. Uh, Senator Lang moves that Senate File 2969 be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Finance Committee. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those, those opposed? Aye. Any um, With that, uh, any opposed? Motion carries, the bill is passed, on to finance. Thank you. Thank we you, Madam Chair. Members, um, next we have Senate File 3063, and Senator Weber, would you take the gavel? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, we are now going to 3063. Uh, this bill, when leaving this committee, will go to Civil Law and Data Practices Committee. Um, and Senator Rood, uh, you may proceed when you are ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senate File 3063 increases the civil, civil penalties for violation of snowmobile um, leaving the trail. Um, in greater Minnesota, snowmobiling is a $200 million industry. Um, it brings tourism um, uh, all, over this, all over to many of our districts. It's, it's really uh, incredibly important. Our snowmobile clubs uh, throughout the state work very hard on maintaining the trails, um, working with landowners, and we really depend on the landowners for the trail system that we have. And the snowmobile clubs have worked very hard. You will see that they put up uh, a lot of signage. Um, they work really hard with the landowners, and they work very hard on education of snowmobilers. Um, but it doesn't seem to be quite enough. And I know in my own district, uh, we just lost uh, a big portion of the trail um, because of trespass. And you can't blame the landowners because they, they get tired of the, the trespassing um, and going off trail, even though the signage and, and everything is very clear. And it's, and it's the few bad actors um, that it happens with. And so we, uh, this bill increases the penalties and we are hoping that maybe that'll be a deterrent um, for our snowmobile clubs. And with that, I have uh, testifiers, if they'd like to come up to the table, please. Welcome to the committee. And uh, first on the agenda for testifying today is Doug Franzen from the Minnesota United Snowmobiles Association. And um, we will turn it over to you. Please identify yourself for the record. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Doug Franzen, and I'm here on behalf. <laughs> My name is Doug Franzen. <laughs> Senator Lang didn't hear me. Uh, and I am behalf on here on behalf of the Minnesota United Snowmobilers Association, uh, as we refer to it, uh, Min USA. Uh, it's a group of Minnesota citizens who uh, volunteer to develop, maintain snowmobile trails throughout the state, uh, teach safety to our youth, and uh, really promote appropriate snowmobiling. Uh, we have a problem that's not unique, and that is, uh, the Chair Rood had said, the problem of trespassing on private land. Minnesota has approximately 22,000 miles of snowmobile trails running throughout the land. 
vast majority of these trails disappear in the summer. The existence of Minnesota's snowmobile trail network, which I believe is the finest in the nation, is totally dependent on the, on the goodwill of our landowners, who, by the way, provide annual easements for these recreational trails, and they do it for no compensation. That is a volunteer uh, endeavor on the part of the landowners, too, being part of the community and promoting outdoor recreation for all Minnesotans. You don't have to be a member to be on these uh, trails, you have to be a snowmobile, uh, but there it's, it is open to the general public, all of these trails. What we have, a problem has developed when, with people leaving the trails. Um, as Chair Rood said, our trails are very well marked and the most frequent a uh, sign you will see on these trails as they wind through the forests and the hills and the valleys is stay on the trail. Um, but some folks uh, tend to see a field of, of virgin snow, powder snow, and it looks like a lot of fun, and it is. Uh, there's two groups of people that don't do this. The first group is people that don't know any better. And as uh, Chair Root had said, we have extensive education uh, efforts on social media, signs, signage on the trails, et cetera, to let them know it's not okay to leave the trail and trespass on uh, private land. Now that field I talked about just a second ago could be uh, more than an irritation or an annoyance. Imagine that farmer who owns that field has planted it with winter wheat or other crops. Running a snowmobile on it can destroy those crops. Um, and, but again, most people just don't know that. They don't know enough and we're trying to cure that with education. The second group of people, which are very few and uh, the damage they cause far outweighs their numbers, is people who are jerks. They don't care. They don't care about their neighbors. They don't care about the graciousness of the landowners. They just are interested in their own fun. This bill is directed towards those folks. The current civil penalties for uh, trespass in a snowmobile are clearly inadequate to act as any deterrent. Uh, people don't seem to care. If you've got $50 at stake, it's like, oh, what the heck, why not? And Terry Hutchinson will talk about his experiences in his county with the, the disregard of the current fine schedule. We believe that this bill will make that group of people pay attention and will, in fact, act as a deterrent. All motorized groups support this legislation. It's not just for snowmobilers, it's for ATVs, for trucks, motorcycles, et cetera. The DNR is supportive of it. Uh, it's simply a common, piece, common sense piece of legislation and we are grateful for Senator Root's leadership on this. And with that, with your permission, Mr. Chair, I'd like to turn it over to Terry Hutchinson, the, tra the chair of our Trails and Legislative Committee. Very good. Welcome, uh, Mr. Hutchinson. Please, uh, please identify yourself for the record. Yes, I'm Terry Hutchinson. I'm the President uh, Trails and Legislative Committee Chairman for MenUSA. And I just wanted to share a couple examples over the last two years. Um, in my county, in one instance, our recreational sheriff deputy stopped five individuals trespassing on private property in the middle of a hayfield. Um, he chose to try to be a nice guy, uh, give him a warning, threaten him with a $100 fine, and they all promised to never do that again. The following Saturday, he went back to the same property and arrested all five of them for trespassing because $100 meant nothing. Another trespasser in our county offered to pay the deputy 
a couple hundred dollars if he could just take the money and when he got back from his shift he could just pay the fine so he didn't have to deal with it. So we desperately need the increased fines. It's, it's helping. Um, my county has actually increased the fines and that's prevented quite a few of them from continuing on. So, but it's a, it's a real problem for us statewide and this is something we really need to do. We need to charge our violators more money. It just, it's really important. Thank you, Mr. Hutchinson. Yes, Mr. Franzen. Yes, Chair Weber, the final thing I would say is uh, you could have a snowmobile trail 100 miles long. And if one irate landowner withdraws an easement of 50 feet, that may, in some cases, shut the entire trail down, or 100 feet. Um, the trail system is that the legislature really envisioned years ago is, is brilliant, but it's also fragile. And as snowmobilers, we take this very, very seriously, and we ask for your assistance. Thank you. And we have Mr. Bone uh, from the ATV. So we will turn it over to you. Please identify yourself for the record. Mr. Chair, uh, my name is Ray Bone. I'm with the representing the All Terrain Vehicle Association of Minnesota, as well as the Amateur Riders and Motorcycles, which are the dirt bikers. Um, we strongly support this legislation. I want to thank uh, Senator Rood for bringing it forward and MinUSA. Uh, we believe in um, strong penalties. We have strong penalties as it relates to... Um, to wetland damage and things like that, which we had to institute because, uh, frankly, we're getting tired of, uh, of having to pay for their sins, these people that didn't want to play nice. So we support strong penalties. It's got to sting. If it doesn't sting, they're, they're not worth much. So um, we support this. I don't think we have quite the problem uh, that MinUSA has, but we do have people that leave the trail, and we want them to stay on the trail we put a lot of money in our trail ambassadors program to ensure that uh, if they that they do stay on the trail, and we encourage uh, strong enforcement um, of the, of that. We don't you know we have restitution if someone gets off the trail and causes damage either on public land or private lands they they can they can be charged for for restitution. Uh, so we we encourage strong enforcement. We think that's the best thing for our for our group and the most responsible way. We provide plenty of education. There's no reason why people can't get educated. We did have a little issue, obviously, with the COVID that slowed us down a little bit on the education because we couldn't have the classes that we normally have. But still, we educate three to 4,000 people um, uh, a year, and adults and, children, and, and kids. So um, we believe, in, we believe uh, in enforcement, and we support enforcement. And, uh, uh, and I should also mention that the... Uh, Four Wheel Drive Association strongly supports this as well, and I think you have a letter uh, from them in the packet. So we all, literally all support this, and we think it's very good legislation. Thank you, Mr. Bowen. Also, oh, uh, Senator Herr. Yeah, um, I was supposed to hear that there's bribery taking place on an incident like this. How often does it happen, and, and is the individual uh, also been charged with bri bribing an officer? Mr. Franzen? I, I'm sorry, I, forgive me, my, I couldn't hear. Oh, okay. Said to her, would you repeat yes. the question? Um, yeah, uh, Mr. Hutchinson, I, I think earlier you talked about, you know, um, the, the, the violator, they yes. um, would bribe the officer. Yeah. Did you, did you say that earlier? Or? Did, the, the reference to the individual who offered the money to the deputy, it wasn't in form of a bribe, it was more in form of a, um, uh, for him to pay the fine, is that correct? Correct, yeah, it was not a bribe, it was purely I don't want to deal with it and $100 means nothing to me, so I'll just pay you. Okay, how often does this incident like that happen? Oh, I don't have any way of verifying that, but I would say quite often that the $100, the present fine, means nothing because we have trespass occurring throughout the whole state. We've lost miles of trails just this year alone. 
So it, it's a continuing problem that needs to stop. Right. Yeah. Thank, thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chair. I, you know, maybe bribery might be a, a, not the right word to use, but it's come kind of close to that part. So I, <laughs> yeah. so I, I, I want to um, make a rest. And, and things like, you know, this bill would be good, and things like that need to, need to stop as well. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Chair, especially when he says keep the change. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> right. That's right. Yeah, I didn't add that part. <laughs> uh, we have a fourth testifier who is participating through Zoom, uh, Mr. Daniel Wilm, and he is in the process of, uh, uh, he's on, I know, and if he would uh, join audio, uh, please identify yourself for the record and you may proceed when you are ready, Mr. Wilm. Hey, thank you, uh, Chairman. My name is Dan Wilm, W-I-L-M. Uh, I reside in Pequot Lakes, Minnesota, and I want to thank everybody for the opportunity to uh, testify today. Um, a question on the um, language, um, Madam Chair. On line 2.9D, it reads, if the peace officer determines that there is damage to property regarding restitution, the commissioner must send a written explanation of the extent of damage and the cost of repair by first class mail to the address provided by the person receiving the citation within 15 days of the date of the citation. Is this new language? I looked at the, um, the uh, previous or previous statute and didn't find similar language. Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Chair and Mr. Wilm, this is not new language. The only new language, if you have it in front of you, are the things that are underlined. And so we haven't changed that portion of the bill. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so this would cover all lands, public or private, where the damage is occurring. Is that correct? Madam Chair? I believe so. Trespass is trespass, whether it's on uh, public land or private land. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think everybody's in agreement here that more enforcement is needed. I know I participated in a, in a WebEx meeting regarding Spider Lake uh, trail system updates. Um, last April, and both Joe Unger, DNR, and Dave Halsey of ADVAM said we need more enforcement. And my, I think this is a good first step, but to be honest with you, without more COs on the ground, um, it's pretty hard to catch people doing illegal activities um, Without without more officers in the field, I know you know last year with the riots, the presidential visits, the pipeline protests, a lot of the CEOs, which are understaffed anyhow, um, were pulled aside and work in that detail as well. And I just strongly feel that we need more officers to go along with this because Minnesota is short, so 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 short staffed. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. Wilm. Um, members, are there any further questions? Senator Swazinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Bond, I think you said, and I'm perplexed, you said um, that your organization had to pay the fees of violators when the violators aren't caught, or did I mishear you? Your organization had to pay the fees? I'm, I'm, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I don't remember. Okay, I, mis okay. I, I misunderstood yeah. something. But okay. we do, if I could just, if I could just uh, add to that, many times if there is a serious violation and, and someone isn't caught, our clubs will go in and restore an area or, or help, help pay for restoration. That's not uncommon. Our, our clubs, you know, work with the local, local uh, uh, agencies or the DNR to make sure that the problem is, is taken care of, is rectified. Okay. That must have been what you yeah. said. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes. Senator Root. Mr. Chair and Senator Swinsky, it is um, uh, quite often the fact if they don't catch somebody but uh, a wetland has been um, damaged or uh, someone has gone off trail, 
Um, the, the clubs do really work hard um, because they don't want their trails to disappear, so they work very hard with the landowners to do restoration, and a lot of time that comes right out of the club's pocket and um, volunteer help to do that. So while it might not be monetary restitution, they really do work hard to make sure that those damages are taken care of. Senator Sinjum, did you have a question? Uh, just a comment, and then Senator Root, I, I, I really don't want to pick on your bills because I don't want to, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I'll be dead honest with you. I don't think 250 bucks is, I mean, is, is going to stop anybody. I mean, I, I just had a friend that spent, he showed me his snowmobile that he bought for his wife, $18,000. Yeah. Uh, and, and then, you know, the, the trailers and the pickups and, and everything to go with that to, to, ha to enjoy this sport. I mean, these, these, this is a big money deal, and I don't think a peasly little, if you will, $250 is going to defer anybody, uh, honestly. Uh, I just think, it, I honestly think it ought to be more than that. I mean, when, when you think about the values to these trails, to the Brainerd Lakes area, filling those resorts uh, every weekend, and, and, and then you got the 100-mile trailer, and, and, and you can't, you, you, you can't, you can use some of it, but, you know, Take a piece out of the middle of that, and you just destroy a whole thing, you know, which has tremendous economic value to, to certainly the economy of an area, and even, frankly, even our state of Minnesota. It's, it's. Uh, I guess I'm just telling you how I feel. I, I, I'd, I'd make it a thousand dollars right off the, you know, give them something to talk about. <laughs> you know, you make it a thousand dollars, and whether that game warden's around or not, they may think he's around. They may think he's got a drone. They may think he's on an airplane above you, but. But uh, they're going to think two or three times on $1,000. The folks I know that would do this, 250 is a blink of an eye. They don't care. Senator Root. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chair and Senator Sendrum, I don't think there's anybody here that would disagree with you. I, if we thought that we could get higher fees passed and we could slap them a little harder, I think we would love to do that. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is we are really increasing the fees greatly now. And so I think this is what we, we feel we can get past at this time. But I share your sentiment. I know you were up uh, in the area. Um, and, I, and you know uh, how incredible uh, important this is to our economy. So I don't think there's anyone that disagrees with you. Well, Madam Chair, it's, it's really not a fee. It's a violation for breaking yes. the law. Which, which may, which has all kinds of implications economically and otherwise. So, uh, wink, anybody can wink at me if they want me to make an amendment. But I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, I'm, I'm all for a stricter, stricter fine. I really am. Senator Hurd. Really stop this and create a buzz, if you will. You, you, um, you got to get it up there where people kind of start talking yeah. about it. Along, along the same line as getting a wink to make an amendment, uh, I was wondering if this penalties equate to, you know, traffic tickets, like would that end up on their, uh, you know, driving or vehicle operation uh, records? Yeah. Mr. Franzen or Mr. Hudson? Mr. Chairman, I believe that these are transferable. I'm no. Well, no. I'm, I'm being corrected by Colonel Smith, yeah. who knows more about this. Uh, but could I take one second to reply to uh, Certainly. Senator Sengen? There's a strong contingent in our membership that believe at least repeat, the penalty for repeat violations should be confiscation of the snowmobile. And we may get to that at some point. But as another witness said, we believe this is a good first step. And being optimistic about human nature, we think if we have a slightly larger stick and uh, the carrot of education, we might not need to uh, have as significant a fines. But I cannot promise we won't be back next year or the year after saying we were wrong. We've got to toughen this up. Mr. Bowen. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members, I, I believe the only, the only violation that transfers to, the, to your license record or your driving record is uh, dealing with the alcohol. Alcohol, yeah. alcohol. And I think that's the only one. One of the things that we did 
a number of years ago, uh, meaning the ATVs and the dirt bikes, we, we got frankly tired of people running around wetlands and destroying wetlands. So we actually, first initially we had um, um, restitution. And, and it can be pretty costly to restore a wetland. We had, we had a uh, father and son that got caught destroying a wetland or damaging a wetland. And I think, you know, their fine was a couple of hundred bucks, but they had an $8,000 bill to pay. So restitution, uh, and the word gets around really fast on that. Uh, same thing with confiscation. Uh, our folks finally decided they were tired of that and the repeat offenders. And we actually worked for and did get legislation, and it's in the law here somewhere, I'm not sure but, uh, where, but um, where if you, if you really go in and damage a wetland, they can confiscate your machine as well. And um, we don't think that's too onerous. And it was interesting is when, I, when we passed that legislation, it actually got some media, and I looked at the websites <laughs> The, the, in what was trending, and it was it was interesting. Some of the responses on there, was, and the one that I remember best was, "My God, my God, these guys are starting to get serious." <laughs> so that's what we want them to understand. But you couple that with our education programs, which I think are model for the for the nation actually, and and then you couple uh, that with our trail ambassadors program. I think last year we had about 280 uh, folks from our various clubs that would actually go out and and be at the trailheads distributing literature, safety and environmental literature. And they would also um, talk to people. And sometimes they would, ca they would catch people uh, not, a not adhering to the law. And they would, they would certainly um, rein them in. They would tell them. Now, there's been instances where, where our folks out, you know, this, uh, patrolling, not patrolling, I shouldn't say that's not the right word, but, but monitoring what's going on in the system, uh, their trail, and a lot of them like to do this on their own set of trails as well as other trails around the state. Um, they get some pretty heavy duty pushback. And if they're breaking a law and that happens, most of these folks have developed pretty good relationships with their COs, and they'll, they do not hesitate calling their CO and say, hey, we got someone here you need to come out and talk to, and they will. And, and that has helped, I think, quite a bit, at least tame down uh, and keep, keep our folks, uh, 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 or keep those people who are kind of the rogue riders uh, aware that, that if they can maybe get away with this once in a while, but they're not going to get away with it for very long, and they're going to be caught, and they'll be prosecuted, and they're going to pay if they damage uh, both private or public property. Senator Sosinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate how often you guys have said it, the word education in today's hearing, because I concur. And it made me think, when I take a class to get my driver's license, is even lip service paid to, and I know this class is for people getting their car license, but we'd like to also make you aware of snowmobiling and motorcycle um, and you know three-wheelers and all the other wonderful opportunities we provide people. Or, you, well, uh, thank, you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman, um, yes. Senator, what, what happens if someone purchases a, 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 an OHV, um, if it's a dealer, they're given all that information. They know where they can go to get cl classes. Sometimes the manufacturer actually pays for those classes. So um, they are provided all that information, and there are certain, depending upon when they were born, the same thing I think with snowmobilers, they have to attend those classes or they'll be driving uh, uh, illegal or they won't be able to get their certificate. But they have to have that certificate uh, uh, after a certain date that they have taken that class. So, um, so uh, most people are made, are made aware that their resources are out there and there are a plethora of, of classes, I think both snowmobile and, and uh, ATV, for example, that are, that are sponsored by the local clubs in conjunction with DNR enforcement. And, and frankly, uh, you say we do, I think, three to 4,000 a year, is my recollection. 
that we train. Now, the last few years, it tapered off a bit because of the COVID. But, uh, but we have great participation and uh, great uh, reception to our education. And our, our training takes into account not only, um, not only just the safety, but also environmental as well. Um, we have, uh, oh, Mr. Franzen. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you for this. I, I will point out that the bill progressively increases the fine. So for third and subsequent offenses, it is $1,000 each time. Again, I'm not saying that's adequate, but it's, it's good. And uh, also in our snowmobile safety training, all, train, all our trainers are all volunteers. Um, we do tell them an the important part of safety is staying on the trail because that is groomed, developed, and maintained, whereas raw land, there may be hidden dangers, et cetera. So it's a, it's a critical part of safety as well. And our online testifier has his hand raised. Mr. Wilm, please proceed. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, just, th and this is information that's available to anybody. You know, if you look at uh, the newsletters from ATV Minnesota, the only statistics that show um, citations versus warnings that sort of apply to what we're talking about today are public highway, which in uh, 2021, there were 219 warnings versus 62 citations. Allow illegal operations, 53 citations versus 128 warnings and operate on snowmobile trail, 32 warnings, 13 citations. Um, it points out the difficulty in enacting a lot of this stuff without more COs on the ground. And like it or not, that's a big part of this discussion. Um, and we can't deny that, we can't ignore it. I don't know if you know, if Rodman Smith is going to testify or not, or, you know, his hands are tied. But the simple fact of the matter is, is without more de dedicated CEOs, all these attempts are, are doomed for failure. It's very difficult to catch so many of these violators. It just is. So, uh, uh, Senator Rood. Um. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Wilm. I think we should get back to the bill. The bill de deals with increased penalties, and the fact that we need more COs on the ground is probably a discussion for another day. But I think we should just stick to the bill here, and the bill we are talking about is increased fines. And I guess I would just appreciate uh, your support for this bill, and it does have another journey. It goes to civil law. So unless you have caught a wink, Senator Senjum, we will proceed with uh, uh, Senator Rood would make the motion to move the bill to move to pass the bill and move it to Civil Law and Data Practices Committee. Uh, with that, uh, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, opposed, same sign. Motion is carried. Uh, the bill is passed and will be re-referred to the Civil Law and Data Practices Committee. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Thank members. You. And with no uh, further business before this committee, we are adjourned. <laughs>